Hello friends, or perhaps I should say, greetings comrades. I'm Dr Thomas Waters and welcome to my video series on revolutions and the making of the modern world. This series is about the history of revolutions over the past two and a half centuries. It's a history that brims with electrifying ideologies and inspiring bids for emancipation and freedom, but it also contains civil wars, bloody reprisals and terrorised opponents. Revolutions spawn new forms of ritual and dress, speech, gesture and art, all of which could be heady and exciting. In time though, these new cultural conventions could become as oppressive, conservative and stifling as those they replaced, if not more so. Utopian visions of the future and attempts to fundamentally change the social order abound in revolutions. But foreign powers often interfere, ensuring that strategic interests and international rivalries do as much to shape the outcome of revolutions as do domestic idealism and political ideology. In other words, the modern history of revolutions is a rich, complex but inherently fascinating topic. You can use it to feed your imagination and by studying, researching and writing about its constituent components you can also use it for your own intellectual growth and edification. But the history of revolutions isn't just interesting or good to know, as they say. It's also a necessary subject. Necessary because, I think, we live in increasingly revolutionary times. In much of the world a desire for far-reaching change is coalescing. It has many sources nationalism, climate change and ecological degradation, the increasing gulf between rich and poor, strains associated both with population growth and decline, financial crises and stagnant or falling living standards for large swathes of working and middle class people in quite a few places. Whatever its origins, an appetite for radical and even revolutionary politics seems to be growing. It takes many different forms from the January 6, 2021 storming of the US Capitol building to the direct action of Extinction Rebellion, some aspects of the programme of Black Lives Matter, Islamic fundamentalism and fascistic right-wing movements, to name but a few of many. In these times, which feel like they might be edging towards revolution, I think we could do worse than look to history for knowledge, comparisons and perspective. In this video, I want to outline um, the definition of revolution. Revolution is a powerful resonant word that can mean many different things indeed. Because it's such a powerful and resonant word, it's rather abused by advertisers and marketers. Having a quick look around for egregious examples for this video, I discovered all sorts of purportedly revolutionary products, I found revolutionary makeup. There was revolutionary fast food, revolutionary burgers in fact, and there were even revolutionary jeans too. Obviously that's just marketing hyperbole, the sort of tall talk that advertisers use because we respond to it. A more defensible, serious and sincere definition of revolution needs to encompass um, two sorts of undertakings. The first of those is narrower, more political and probably the primary sense in which scholars, political activists and the public more widely use the word revolution. It's revolution in the sense of a fundamental change in the nature of governance and power. The forcible transfer of state power was how the historical sociologist and very distinguished American academic Charles Tilley defined this sort of revolution. But already you may notice problems with that definition, the forcible transfer of state power. It doesn't distinguish clearly enough um, a revolution from a coup d'etat, from a kick of the state, where one ruler or a group of rulers is removed and others installed in their place but without any far-reaching or systematic change. Whatever else a revolution is, it's not just a simple change in personnel. A second problem with Charles Tilley's definition of revolution as the forcible transfer of state power is that not all political revolutions have been violent. If you'd like examples of these non-violent political revolutions, think about what happened in many, although not all, of the Central and Eastern European satellite states of the Soviet Union in 1989, or Portugal's so-called Carnation Revolution in 1974. 
arguably also the ending of apartheid in South Africa in the 1990s. So the first and narrower component of the definition of revolution is a fundamental, systematic political change, often though not always forceful. But there's a second defensible meaning of the word revolution, relating to far-reaching transformations in the economy, society and culture. If you read volume one of Karl Marx's Capital, or Das Kapital, you'll find that almost all of the revolutions mentioned in that text are primarily economic revolutions, because Marx saw changes in economic production and exploitation as the ultimate source of changes in politics, society and culture. I don't think this model's always right, but Marx had a point about the deep and interrelated nature of revolutions. To take one example, the Industrial Revolution in Britain during the later 1700s and early 1800s. It may have brought about only modest levels of economic growth, at least compared to the astonishing growth rates of places like China in recent years. But Britain's Industrial Revolution, its first Industrial Revolution, had massive transformative consequences not just in the work people did and the products they consumed, but knock-on effects in communications, transport, education and politics. Another striking example of this revolution in the wider social, economic and cultural sense might be the women's revolution of first and second wave feminism during the late 19th and 20th centuries. It weakened, though didn't destroy the previously universal patriarchal system, first by winning political rights for women, and then by bringing about far-reaching changes in gender roles. So, in other words, a revolution can be two things. One, systematic political change, or two, fundamental transformations in economic society and culture. What complicates things further is that sometimes the first political revolution uh, brings about the second, say in Haiti after the Haitian Revolution of 1791 to 1804, or in Russia following the Second or Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. But it doesn't always happen this way. The American Revolution is perhaps a good example of a political revolution that did not, at least initially, become a social or economic revolution. As a final layer of complexity, Uh, Let's return to the point I was raising a few moments ago that sometimes economic, social and cultural revolutions help to ultimately engender political revolutions. Now, for any viewers wanting to hone their skills in research, writing and thinking, I've got a brief exercise. I'd like you to come up with your own one-sentence definition of a revolution. I think it'd be a good idea if you wrote it at the start of a document or a notebook where you can keep your thoughts and research on revolutions if you want to continue looking into this topic. And as you build up your knowledge and notes, you can review and revise your definition. To get your juices flowing, so to speak, here's my definition. A revolution is an attempt to make a new state or a new world. If you're wondering how I came up with that, It's a bit of a marriage of Charles Tilley's definition, which I mentioned earlier, with some ideas inspired by a recent anthropology of revolutions published by California University Press. Thanks for watching and good luck on your own journey into the history of revolutions.